All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you all here for stories from the Gettysburg battlefield. And I see some familiar faces and some not so familiar. So I will introduce myself. I'm Peter Carmichael. I am the Fleur Professor of Civil War Studies at Gettysburg College. So I am in the history department and I am also the director of the Civil War Institute. And I will be brief since many of you know what the Institute is about. Uh, we uh, sponsor, uh, or I should say, we support the Brian Pohanka Internship Program. It's our flagship program. It's a program that places anywhere from 25 to 35 students at various historical sites. I have many former Pohankas with us and some who will be first time Pohankas uh, this summer. Pohanka Internship is about getting our students at historical sites and so they have an opportunity to work with the public to talk to the public, uh, to answer visitor questions, to do research. If you've not thought about the Pohanka, I hope you'll give it some consideration. In fact, we have a few Pohanka positions that are still out there. So if you did not apply in the fall and you have some interest, you should write me, P. Carmichael, or Jill Titus. I'll say something briefly about Jill and she can speak more about her background. Uh, Jill is the Associate Director of the Civil War Institute. Uh, she is a PhD from UMass. She is not a specialist in the Civil War, but in the civil rights. But I'll let Jill speak about her uh, most recent book that just came out. Go ahead, Jill. So um, I wrote a book about the 100th anniversary commemoration of Gettysburg, how Gettysburg was remembered and interpreted in the 1960s, and what that had to do with present day politics, how things like the civil rights movement and the Cold War influenced how people chose to remember Gettysburg and the, the various elements that they drew out of its, its meaning um, and the way that that anniversary shaped the landscape of the battlefield itself. So today we kind of have things broken up that people talk more about the battle itself. And I'll talk a little bit toward the end about the aftermath of the battle and about the, the, the early kind of the, the early fashioning of civil war memory, how people in the first couple of decades after the battle, thought about Gettysburg, memorialized Gettysburg, um, and used the battlefield itself for commemorative purposes. Um, one other thing that I want to note is that uh, we also oversee two minors at the Civil War Institute. One is the public history minor. Again, if you've had any thought about being a historian who works at a museum or a cultural center or a battlefield, I'd give the public history minor some consideration. If you're a history major, that minor and that major work together quite nicely. We also oversee the Civil War Air Studies minor. Uh, and some of you are already in that program. It, again, uh, it is a focus on the American Civil War as one would expect, but it also gives you an opportunity to think about the Civil War from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. So two minors that we also oversee, we'd be thrilled to talk to any students who might be interested in that. So finally, if you have questions, type away or comments, please don't wait to the end. And as uh, Jill and I are making our way through our conversation with you today, we will happily stop and answer your questions in the moment. And again, if you have some insights or comments as well that you want to offer, uh, don't hesitate to share them with us. So I'm going to begin, of course, uh, what's a uh, presentation without PowerPoint these days? And we'll start with the very first one, Jill, of none other than Robert E. Lee. So I'm going to be fairly focused and efficient about the history. So again, don't hesitate. You want to interrupt me if I've gone too fast. You want some elaboration? Uh, I'm happy to give it. So R. E. Lee, in the summer of 1863, is at the very pinnacle of his military fame. He had just come off a spectacular victory at Chancellorsville in May of 1863. Chancellorsville is in Virginia, not far from Fredericksburg. He used that victory, in a sense, as a launching pad to take his army to the north as a raid into Pennsylvania. The reasons to do so were compelling. Uh, above all else, he wanted to give Central Virginia a break from the war, and he wanted to take his army into Pennsylvania knowing that they could live off the land. Now, I want to be clear, 
Lee's men at this stage of the war did not behave as we will see in 1864, like Sherman's men did in Georgia, Mississippi, as well as North Carolina. Those men, as you probably know, they foraged or lived off the land. They are pretty hard on the civilian population. Uh, much of what they've done has been exaggerated over the years in Southern folklore, but nonetheless, Sherman's men in 1864, the year that followed Gettysburg, they brought a hard war to the civilian populace. Uh, these men didn't really do that to Pennsylvania, but I want to be clear, they were good Southern gentlemen as well. They did not respect private property. Uh, they took freely, they didn't destroy a whole lot, but one thing they did do that's almost always overlooked is that it was an army of slave catchers. If you're a person of color in this part of Pennsylvania, uh, you would be seen by these men as potentially a runaway slave. And as a consequence, many African-Americans, people of color were captured, treated as runaways, and then shipped back into Virginia. Uh, we don't have the numbers, I suspect in the few hundreds uh, that some I should also know maybe never spent a day of their lives in slavery or in servitude. But in Richmond, put on the slave market and sold, shackled, and of course, uh, put into uh, enslavement. I just want you all to think about this for a moment. You've been to Gettysburg many times. You've probably been to the National Park Service Visitor Center. And when you're there, you will now, for the first time, hear the story of African-Americans. Uh, there was a time though when I was your age, uh, that story never surfaced. And one of the things that's compelling about this place, like any historical site, is the stories that are told, the stories that people want to hear. And it's important for us as public historians to understand and appreciate what Americans want from their Civil War past. They almost always want bedtime stories. And when it comes to Gettysburg in particular, they want stories that make the battle appear to be accidental and a battle in which we should think about the heroism and sacrifice without the politics. This accidental battle, uh, it diminishes uh, and absolutely ignores the high political stakes as to why Lee did what he did. Not only was he giving Virginia a break from the war, not only was he allowing his army to live off the fruits of Virginia uh, farmers, he wanted to seek European recognition and fuel the anti-war effort in the North. He knew the North was war weary and he knew that a victory on Northern soil could very well lead Lincoln to come to the bargaining table. The political stakes were extraordinarily high. Why is war fought? Well, it's fought for a political end and that political end of course was independence for that Confederate nation. That's why these men fought that's why they died. And if you go to the battlefield today, often the monumentation, which Joe will talk about in just a little bit, it either diminishes or ignores entirely the political stakes. All right, the next slide. Oops, I wasn't expecting that one. So there is a uh, Northern rendition of uh, Confederates who have come into a store. I'm not sure where this is supposed to be located, but as you can see, they're having their way, taking freely from the storekeeper here who looks utterly befuddled. That's the representation of what happened in the North, and I don't think that's probably too much of an exaggeration. All right, Jill, could you go to the next picture, please? And there we have George Gordon Meade, George Gordon Meade, who is the commander of the Union Army at Gettysburg, the Army of the Potomac. He was a man in his early 40s, although if you look at his mug, it looks like uh, Mr. Meade did not get enough sleep the night before this photograph. He's got some serious bags under those eyes. Uh, they called him a snapping turtle, and I think that's in part because his personality had a little bit of an edge to it. He had a fierce temper, but he was a man who took control of the Army of the Potomac just a few days before the battle erupted. It speaks volumes to his patriotism and his sense of duty to take on a command of an army that was just, it was a political mess. Uh, the Army of the Potomac fighting within the shadow of Washington, D.C., always had to contend with the politics of Washington. Politicians, particularly Republicans, as you might know, it's the Republican Party, it's the party of Abraham Lincoln. They are micromanaging this thing. And if they sensed that one of their generals in the Army of the Potomac was a Democrat and a Democrat who made a mistake on the battlefield, their time was up. 
And so me trying to be apolitical, he certainly leaned a little bit more at the Democratic side. But coming into this situation, you can only imagine just a few days before the battle, he is suddenly given the helm, the reins of this great army, an army that was about 110,000, roughly. You know what? That's a little bit much. That's not right. That's not right. Army of the Potomac, in terms of its numbers, is about 90,000. And that sounds right. 90,000. Lee's army had about 70,000. 90,000, Army of the Potomac, Lee's army, Army of Northern Virginia, about 70,000. And let me say one other thing about George Gordon Meade. There has been over the years what I believe are downright slanderous accusations about how he fought this battle, that he fought it tentatively, that he was conservative, and he did so because it reflected his political persuasion as a Democrat. There is nothing in the evidence to support that whatsoever. He did a masterful job during the Pennsylvania campaign, and he was unable, as you all know, to pursue Lee's army, not because he was slow, not because he was hesitant, not because he was passive. He's no George B. McClellan, but rather it is the logistics of the moment. It is an army that's been worn down by three days of fighting. Yes, Lee's army escapes. I'm, of course, I'm uh, revealing the end here. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, Lee's army was allowed to escape across the Potomac. Abraham Lincoln was bitterly disappointed by that. Abraham Lincoln did not understand the realities of what Civil War generals had to contend with. It was nearly impossible for an army to be annihilated during the Civil War. Lincoln expected it. The Northern people expected it. It just simply was not in the cards. George Gordon Meade, the last thing, think about it. How many times have you been to his monument? How many times have you walked over to see that it's just behind the Union lines on Cemetery Ridge? Most people don't because the line perspective that visitors have is one of Pickett's Charge. And what do they see? None other than R. E. Lee, right, on that big monument, right? He's riding a horse, it's a quest for a monument. Lee's monument, right? That is what dominates the field. It's one of the bitter ironies about this place. The visitors' attention and their focus, shaped by monuments, those impressive, powerful monuments along Confederate Avenue, including Lee's, that's what captures attention. Poor George Gordon Meade, man, he won this thing, and most people never ever get to see his monument. All right, let's keep moving ahead. Miss Titus, please. There we go. Um, I just not going to give you a detailed blow by blow description of the battle. Many of you already know it. If you look at this map, the thing that's most telling that should stand out is the road networks. Look at all those roads coming from the west, from the north, and from the east, and all converging where? Right at Gettysburg. What's the bedtime story people like to tell about why the battle came? Well, it's accidental, of course, because the Confederates were coming to Gettysburg for, all right, class, if I could have you turn on your mic, you'd all say in unison, for shoes. We all know that that's not the case at all. We all know that Gettysburg had been pretty much looted. I put quotes around that. By Jubal Early's men a few days before the battle, man, it was cleaned out. The reason why the fighting occurred here, it was a good point of convergence for Lee's army. R.E. Lee lacked his cavalry under the famed commander, Jeb Stewart, the guy who had the big plume. He was very much of a dandy, but he was very good at his job at Gettysburg. In part, he failed Lee. Lee gave him discretionary orders, and the result of it was Stuart rode off with his cavalry. You don't have cavalry in the Civil War. You don't have eyes if you're a general. And so Lee stumbled into a battle on July 1st that he did not want. Now, again, we all know how this turned out. We all know that July 3rd, Pickett's Charge was the culmination uh, of this battle. And we all question Lee's judgment on that day. If you've read Killer Angels, the novel by Michael Shara, you should. It's a brilliant book. I think that it gets into Lee's disposition, his thinking, his mood, his emotions, does it well. It translated into a movie. I don't think it translated as well. R.E. Lee played by Martin Sheen. And how Martin Sheen played him, he tried to get those inner doubts. Right? He had to communicate them right, to the audience. And that communication, that articulation of those doubts in the movie makes Lee appear to be weak, indecisive, old, tired, weary. Right? Telling you, he was none of those things. He was sick here at Gettysburg, not feeling well. He had diarrhea, right? So, I mean, that's going to keep you down a little bit. But, told you, Lee's at the pinnacle of his military fame here. 
He's got supreme confidence in the soldiers. They have that in him. And on July 1st, he was not disappointed. What happened was a complete and decisive victory. Didn't destroy the Union Army, but just take a look at the map. You can see the little lines coming down from Barlow and Schimmelfinney, which is north of town. And that entire Union position, including the federal or Union soldiers over at the Lutheran Seminary, not far from our campus, they broke as well. They passed through the town, uh, for the most part, actually orderly, until they reached the high defensive ground. Look at the very bottom of the map. You can see where it says Von Steinwehr, right in that area. That's Cemetery Hill. That's where the Federals formed up. Again, giving the Confederates a complete victory, reinforcing in these minds and in the minds of his subordinates that they were an army that was absolutely unstoppable. Pennsylvania College, of course, is Gettysburg College and it played a role in the battle. The first thing that you're all going to be able to tell your classmates when you return to campus is that the campus was part of the battlefield. Time and time again, the students say to me that the battlefield surrounds the campus. No, the soldiers didn't you know, part around the campus because they respected it as hallowed ground. They fought on our campus. Penn Hall became a hospital, Union and Confederate, but mostly Confederate after the war. The descriptions of Penn Hall, which was the primary academic as well as residency part of our campus, it was an utter wreck, as you can only imagine, in the attempt to try to care for those wounded. They are ripping up, tearing things apart, doing everything they can to try to make the stay of those wounded more comfortable. So Penn Hall, again, also would have, I believe, been almost like a beacon to these Northern soldiers on July 1st as they retreated toward the town of Gettysburg. What they would have been able to see, almost no matter where they were on the field, is Penn Hall itself. Now, the Gettysburg College students were actually somewhere in classes that day, which of course is almost unthinkable when there is an invading rebel army that's on your soil and just a few miles away. But there were some Gettysburg students who left classes and joined. I always get the number. It's, it's not, this is the 126 or 26 uh, militia company. Let's go ahead, Joe. I can't hear you actually. 26th. The 26th, that's right. The militia. And this is a, a very rough analogy, and so I shouldn't make it, but I will. Uh, the militia is kind of like, I uh, have respect for our Boy Scouts, but it's like giving Boy Scouts a bunch of muskets. They're not well trained. They don't have very strong leadership. Uh, they're going up against a veteran army, the Army of Northern Virginia. At one point when the militia ran up against uh, Lee's army, Jubal early yelled at him and said something to the effect, Jubal early, the Confederate, said, boys, if you all don't run, somebody's going to get hurt. And so the militia was not much of an impediment to the Confederate Army, but nonetheless, we had students at our campus who were in the ranks itself. There was also in Lee's Army, a graduate of Pennsylvania College. He was in Pickett's Charge. He was captured at Pickett's Charge. He was in the prison pen, not far from uh, Pennsylvania Hall, or Penn Hall, what we call Penn Hall. He was recognized by the president's son and he was pulled from the pen. I believe he was even allowed, this Confederate was allowed to walk around campus. He had dinner with the president. The conversation turned to politics. I think it was extraordinarily tense. I don't believe it ended on bad terms, but nonetheless, the college students represented themselves mostly on the Union side, but on the Confederate side as well. I want to say very quickly here, because it's related to the Civil War, the idea that Pennsylvania College, that your college is an app or was an abolitionist school is a gross exaggeration. It's just simply not the case at all. Were there abolitionists who were students? Without a doubt. Were the professors? Not so certain about that. But it was not founded upon the principles of abolition. In fact, I just read recently that Thaddeus Stevens, who, and I don't know if he sold or donated land, but it was, again, part of a town boosterism. That's what the college was about. It was about boosterism above all else. And Schmucker, the founder, first president of Pennsylvania College, he certainly had anti-slavery sentiments. There is no doubt about that, but I believe he, and Jill, you can correct me, I think his family at one time actually owned some slaves. So you can't put him in the abolitionist ranks at all. I say all this to you as a reminder, how current day politics always is uh, an influence and in how we look at the past. And we are in a moment of Black Lives Matter, and it seems and it appears to me that there are some people who want to twist the history of Pennsylvania College to make it more in alignment uh, 
with political notions of today. All right, let's keep moving here. I got real quickly, I'm gonna have to run through this. But Joe, if you could go to the next slide, please. There we go. Uh, Richard Yule. Richard Yule was one of Lee's corps commanders. Lee had three, as you can see, man had a massive uh, uh, dome head. He was a man who had replaced Stonewall Jackson. That's not an enviable position at all. He is a man who is often blamed with failing to take, and, and Jill, if you could go to the next slide, please. There we go. Failing to take this position. This is Cemetery Hill. And now this is one other quick anecdote that I will add about Gettysburg, the layers of stories that are built from events between July 1st and July 3rd. And one of the first stories that came out of the failure to take Cemetery Hill is that it was Richard Ewell, Richard Ewell, who did not follow Lee's directive. It is Richard Ewell, if he had only been more like Stonewall Jackson, would have stormed this high ground, the Yankees or Federals being at the very top. And if Richard Ewell had done so, Gettysburg would have been what? A one day battle and a complete Confederate victory. And then, the hallucination begins. This hallucina hallucination is part of the lost cause approach to the Civil War. And it is a defense, a strident defense of R.E. Lee, among many other things. R.E. Lee can make no mistakes. Gettysburg's a tough one for them if you're a lost cause disciple, because he obviously lost the battle. So you got to find some scapegoats. Richard Ewell is one of those scapegoats. And so that hallucination is that he hadn't been there. Jackson was still alive. Confederates were to storm Cemetery Hill. Great Confederate victory at Gettysburg. And man, Federals would have been so terrified that it kept retreating all the way to Washington, D.C. And outside of Washington, who would be there waiting with the keys to the city, but none other than Abraham Lincoln, ready to surrender it to R.E. Lee. War over. And we'd have two nations, one side seeing a Dixie and one side, of course, devoted to slavery. That's the hallucination. And it's still there and it's still with us. And there is nothing where, th where this uh, picture is taken, nothing there to alert visitors, to shake visitors, to get them to think about that this myth, which still has such a hold, such tenacity with people, and it is pure lost cause. That was failed to take on July 1st. The Federals form a defensive position. Jill will quickly go to our next slide. There's Penhall. That picture was taken of our campus shortly before the war. The building, I can't use my cursor, but the building, as we're looking at Penn Hall, just to the left, uh, that no longer stands, but the building off to the far left actually does. Let's keep going here, Jill, if you don't mind. Now here is uh, the position of the contending armies on July the 2nd. You can see Cemetery Hill just below Howard, right in the center of your map. The red, of course, is the Confederates, and you see Ewell as well. On July 2nd, there are two major attacks, Confederate assaults. The first one struck the Union left flank, where it says Wheatfield, Little Round Top, and Sickles. Many of you have been down there. Lots of controversy that day on the Confederate, as well as the Union side. Las Colas raised its ugly head after this uh, war about the Confederate assault under James Longstreet on the far Confederate right. Uh, many of his former comrades accused Longstreet of purposely undermining Lee, of uh, being slow marching on July the 2nd. Much of it is exaggerated, some downright fabricated. The hard fact of it is at the end of July 2nd, these two Confederate attacks came very close to achieving their ultimate success. If you're R.E. Lee and you go to sleep that night thinking, you know, my army's fighting spirit is absolutely undiminished here on Northern soil. What to do on July the 3rd? Let's go to our next map, please. There's a little round top, big round top to the right. Uh, to the right. And they are having, as we speak, some serious issues on little round top with erosion because there's so much civilian traffic up there. Two to three years, that experience on Little Round Top for visitors is going to be very, very different. All right, the next picture, guys show an academic who does something great here at Gettysburg, and that academic is Joshua Chamberlain. And that's what's so remarkable and for you to think about how a colonel of a main regiment on the far left flank at Little Round Top, how he's elevated as the hero of Gettysburg, and that you have George Gordon Meade, who's almost an afterthought, right? It's like, oh, wait, George Gordon Meade helped Joshua Chamberlain win the Battle of Gettysburg. You know, some people don't really believe that, but the attention that this one man gets comes entirely from the novel, Killer Angels, which 
I suggested to you before. Man, Chamberlain's a compelling figure. And not a lot of people are hypercritical of him and they're hypercritical of all the attention and the fame that he gets now. Hell, that's not his fault. I mean, his defense at Little Round Top is truly magnificent. After Gettysburg, he gets severely wounded. At Petersburg in 1864, a bullet went past through both of his hips, severed his urethra. Uh, I mean, the man was in severe agony for the rest of his life. But even after that horrible wound in June of 1864, Chamberlain returned to the Army of the Potomac to fight in its final campaigns. Uh, he's a remarkable person. And if you've not been out to the far left Union flank, you need to do it. You need to read Killer Angels. And this is the man whose story is told there. Uh, and there's James Longstreet. I've already mentioned him. I don't need to say anything more about him. And we'll keep going. And there's Mr. Pickett. George Pickett was very much a dandy. You can see uh, he's got some curly locks there. He loved to perfume them. Uh, he had a bride who was 17 years old. This man was in his 30s. He was deeply in love with her. And she... After the war, after his death, he died in 1870, I believe, uh, she devoted herself to um, elevating his legacy. What he is noted for is, of course, Pickett's Charge, which should be called Pickett and Pettigrew's Charge, if we can go to the next map there, Jill. And there we have it. The final great assault on July the 3rd, which makes almost no sense to anyone who stands on that ground. But if you think about everything that Ari Lee and his subordinates knew up to that point, which is... 1 p.m. on July the 3rd, everything up to that point would suggest that this was an absolute necessity. That Union line, you've all seen it, the point where it is not quite as formidable, meaning that you don't have the high hills and the rugged terrain like you do on the Union right flank and the left flank. The Union center, that ridge line is not so prominent, but the ground in front of it is fairly open. Pickett's men were afforded a fair amount of protection during this frontal attack. Pettigrew, which you see just above or to the north of Pickett, man, it's pancake flat there. There is nothing that protects those Confederates as they made that assault. I won't give you all the machinations of that attack except to say this. There was a massive bombardment, a bombardment that lasted at least an hour, maybe a little bit more. A bombardment that ultimately did what it needed to do, knocked out Union guns. The Confederate infantry followed. One would think that it was doomed from the onset. Not the case at all. Man, there were breakages in the Union line, at least three. Uh, but there's just more not, there were not enough Confederates to follow up that success. This attack lasted certainly less than an hour and about 50% casualties, anywhere from 12 to 14,000 men, 14 at the max, uh, who were used to pick its charge. That 50% casualties, yeah, that's pretty severe. 14,000 men, man, that is not enough soldiers. And that was a real problem for the Confederates that day. It is obviously um, a stunning and important Union victory, a time in which the Northern people were desperate for good news, a time in which you have a rebel army on Southern soil. And thank you, Joel. There again is the Confederate perspective, the clump of trees or cops of trees. That is the Confederate, excuse me, that's the Union Center. The angle is not far from where one of the breakthroughs occurred. The Kandori Farms, where old General Pickett himself, he watched much of the battle. The landscape in front of this uh, particular picture is pancake flat. It's been moved a hell of a lot. And Jill will talk a little bit about, about it. All right, Jill, how are we doing? I need to switch it over to you. That's the Union perspective. You can see off in the distance, the Virginia Monument. That's the monument that has the uh, R.E. Lee, Questerine R.E. Lee at the very top. It is about a mile almost from that wood line where the Lee Monument is to the Union position on Cemetery Ridge, about a mile. Again, the formations that they use, the frontal attacks, do not think for a moment that it was some Napoleonic tactic. Do not think for a moment that these men considered this to be akin to suicide. Don't think that this was done out of honor. This was done after careful deliberation, Ari Lee and Longstreet spent more time planning this attack than any other assault during the Civil War in which they were involved. There was, again, great care. And there was a, I think, reasonable chance of success. All right, and let's see what's next. Just want to show you quickly some photographs. As many of you know, the Fed at Gettysburg were taken by Alexander Gardner and his associates. This is one of the photographs. We're not certain exactly where it was taken. It's of Union dead. If you look closely at this, you can see not only bloated bodies, but you can see 
how their bodies were in a sense desecrated, Confederates had taken off their shoes. And you can also see that these men have not been lined up by burial details. They would dig massive trenches and they would put the bodies there. That's not quite happening here. This is exactly where the men fell. And we'll keep going here. That's on the Confederate side. Look at the difference. You can see that the men are already lined up for burial. This is not where they fell. These are mostly Georgians. There might be a South Carolinian or two in the mix. Uh, these photographs um, became stereo cards. It brought the war to many Northern people. It did not suddenly give people the sense of the real war because uh, all the way to 1865, there still was the uh, imagination of war being something heroic, something in which individual bravery would decide the day and um, a failure to see death in its raw, ugly, horrible form. How do you know the difference between Georgia and South Carolina is a good question. You cannot in this picture whatsoever. There's no way to make that differentiation to my knowledge. More of the South Carolinians were up on the ridge line. If you look carefully at this photograph, you can see a wagon. Uh, most of those are Kershaw's men, they're South Carolinians, they're over there. So it's possible South Carolina got in the mix here, but I think would be unlikely. All right, and then finally, Jill, I don't think we have time for any of the letters. What do you think? We're running really, yeah, really let's tight, I think. Let's just real quickly, the last thing I want to just remind you all, if you've not read William Frazanito, who is a Gettysburg alum, and he did an important book on Gettysburg photography. If we can go back to the dead just real quickly, and then we'll move on to yours, Jill. This photograph this, of a sharpshooter, I remember seeing this as a boy. You can go to this exact spot on the battlefield. If you look at it carefully, you can see, well, wait a minute, this obviously had to be staged. Look at the musket, look at the cartridge box, look how he's aimed. I mean, the man is said as almost he's in a casket, right? And there's a certain you know, almost innocence uh, to this man's death. All right, now the next photograph, William Frazanito, again, this Gettysburg alum, he was able to determine that this body, in this photograph is the same man who was a sharpshooter and what the photographers did, look again the staging, see the kepi, see the musket, see the cartridge box or the haversack, excuse me, that they moved this body. And I just want to just end on this point is that the creation or construction of our memories of this battle took place immediately. The idea that there is just a bunch of facts out there that are waiting for us to recover so that we can understand the battle, that is certainly part of it. But what's called facts, what's not called facts, what facts are deemed important, what facts are not, that is a process. And that process continues to change over time. That's why I encourage all of you to think about being a poheka, because then you become part of that process. You become the gatekeeper. You help people understand what is significant about this place. I'll right, turn it over to Jill. You all have some letters. You can read those on your own. The most interesting, I think, of the batch is the one from John Fudge. And there's a final photograph of McPherson Woods. All right, Jill, thank you so much. Any questions here? Right? How do we know? That's the one. Still got Nothing one. in the chat at the moment. Okay. Yes. I got one up here. You, got, you already answered one. That's right. That's right. Okay. So kind of picking up right there, within a year of the time that this had happened, within a year of the devastation that, that you saw in those photos, commemoration of the battle and preservation of the battlefield itself had begun. Within a year, the Union soldiers who had perished on this field were reinterred in a soldier's national cemetery, which, you know, as, as, as most of you know, was dedicated in November of 1863 by President Lincoln himself. And by the summer of 1864, a group called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association had emerged, and their job was to acquire land that had been part of the battle um, for the stated purpose of, you know, holding and preserving it in perpetuity. And this is this is Reynolds Woods, like Pete said, this is one of the first parts of the battlefield that was acquired by the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And when we think about the fact that a preservation campaign was emerging in the summer of 1864, I think that's incredible. You know, first and foremost, the war was far from won in the summer of 1864. It was looking fairly likely that Abraham Lincoln might lose the presidential election to a peace candidate, that there might be a negotiated settlement between Washington and, and Richmond, you know, that the United States itself might cease to exist. 
You know, Gettysburg's significance in American history stems from the idea that it was the Union Army's greatest victory, that it was the place where the Union was saved, that it was the proving ground for, you know, the, this new birth of freedom that Lincoln talked about in the Gettysburg Address. So what would Gettysburg mean if the war didn't save the Union, if slavery didn't end, if the United States itself ceased to exist? It would mean nothing. But the GBMA people, nonetheless, were still pushing ahead in their determination to make this place a shrine to Union victory. With all of that uncertainty, that's a really gutsy thing. And it's also pretty remarkable, I think, it, given the scale of the very immediate everyday problems faced by local residents. You know, when people came out of their, their cellars or returned to their homes after the armies retreated, they found a, a public health nightmare. You know, their crops were trampled, their wells were drained or contaminated, their, their fences were destroyed, their houses were, were wrecked, you know, pockmarked by shells, everything inside them sort of scattered, confiscated for military use, you know, the dead and dying men and horses everywhere. This is an image of the Abraham Bryan farm, which in 1863 was the home of a black widower with five children. And like Pete said earlier, as Lee's army moved north, it was widely known at the time anyway, that they actively captured um, African Americans who they in or who, who they encountered, whether they were, whether they had any background in slavery or were born free, it didn't matter and, and sold them south. So when word came that the Army of Northern Virginia was entering Pennsylvania, most of the black population of Gettysburg, of course, packed up and fled, um, mostly to Harrisburg. And during the time that Brian was gone, you know, the famous third day assault, Pickett's Charge, took place over his land. And when he got back, this is what he found. You know, his house was ransacked, his, his crops were destroyed, his orchard was destroyed, the field west of his house was a massive graveyard. So the whole town was really a, a hospital scene. You know, there are 30,000 wounded men who needed care and, and about 10,000 bodies scattered around, like in those pictures we just looked at, that needed to be, body, to be buried as, as soon as possible. There were unexploded ordnance, unexploded ammunition laying everywhere. You know, it's often talked about that how remarkable it is that there was only one civilian casualty during the Battle of Gettysburg, Jenny Wade. But it's believed that within the, the, the first year after the or first year or two after the battle that there were 10 more civilians who were killed stepping on ordnance, you know, when they were plowing a field or when they were digging up that when they're digging for relics to sell to tourists. And, you know, and some of those who died were were children. The, the, the battle continued to haunt residents of this community for, 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 for decades, for, you know, for generations. But the, the immediate aftermath, you know, that's, that's my, that, that, at, the, at, the, at this particular moment, people are worried about simple survival. Their livelihoods are destroyed. You know, the businesses and farms that they put a lifetime into, they, most of them were, were, were utterly wrecked. Um, when those who could secure the appropriate documentation to prove that the damages to their property were inflicted by the Union Army, which was not an easy thing to do, they, and filed claims with the federal government, they often got only a fraction of what they asked for, uh, including Pennsylvania College itself. Pennsylvania College received $625 from the federal government for the damage to Penn Hall. And to put that in perspective, that's about 1 28th of what it cost to build the building. This was not enough. Both the college and the seminary, whose main building was equally destroyed, quickly turned to um, really the 1863 equivalent of, of a GoFundMe campaign. They, they put out a subscription begging the general public for help. Like a lot of other local residents, Abraham Bryan, his property was predominantly damaged by Confederate forces, not Union troops. So he filed a claim with the federal government for $1,000 worth of damages, but he only received 15 on the grounds that the federal government wasn't responsible for his losses. And really, people had, had no other recourse but to, to absorb the losses, to depend on family and friends and private charities and churches to help. So, you know, in the months and years after the battle, Gettysburgians were really busy with just the simple task of, 
surviving. So I think it's it's fascinating that so many still gave time and effort and energy to the campaign to establish the National Cemetery and the GBMA's efforts to acquire and preserve battlefield land. The cemetery itself, you know, first and foremost, it was a practical necessity. You know, for health reasons alone, the hastily dug shallow graves around the battlefield couldn't be a permanent solution. But the, the, the fact that the state of Pennsylvania would take the lead, the, the fact that, that the cemetery would be only for the Union dead, um, and the, the design itself, which I have a picture of the design here, the cemetery is very non-hierarchical. The, the, the idea behind the design was that the sacrifice of the lowliest private should be seen on the same scale as the death of um, you know, the most well-known and well-connected officers. All of these features of the cemetery were, were, were they, you know, they, they were not, they were, they, they went far beyond just the practical necessity of, of burying bodies. The, the land where the cemetery is situated, it was chosen because it already bordered the existing Evergreen Cemetery, a town cemetery, but it also was a plot of grand ground that was very heavily associated with the Union victory. It was where the Union lines were. Well, I think every Gettysburg College student probably knows the effort to establish the National Cemetery was led by a Gettysburg, well, Pennsylvania College graduate, David Wills. And Wills worked directly with the governor of Pennsylvania to get funding for this. And he contracted with a local photographer, a man named Samuel Weaver, to oversee the reinterment of about 3,500 Union soldiers. And Weaver's burial crew included yeah, a wait. dozen... Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> Weaver's burial crew included about a dozen African-American men who were overseen by uh, a black teamster named Basil Biggs who had moved his family to Gettysburg from Maryland before the war in order to secure an education for his children. And this is a picture of Basil Biggs and his wife, Mary, in, in the post-war years. And Biggs, like Abraham Bryan, filed a, a claim for substantial damages. I think his was about $1,500, um, and he got uh, also all, almost nothing because his property had was deemed to have been damaged by the Army of Northern Virginia, not the not the, U, the U.S. Army. So Weaver's crew, under Biggs's direction, used a survey of burial sites that had been commissioned by David Wills as the basis for their work. And this was quite the process. You remember, this is the Victorian era where sensibilities about death were, were very, very formal. And, and despite the, the, the gore associated with this, the burial crew really went to great lengths to try to hew to these cultural sensibilities about respectful treatment of the dead. When a body was exhumed, the first thing that they would do was determine whether it was Union or Confederate, because if it was Confederate, they were going to leave it where it was. It wasn't until the 1870s that there were large scale efforts to remove Confederate bodies from their places on the battlefield and return them to cemeteries in the South. They were only going to be moved to the National Cemetery if it was a Union soldier. So how do you think they could tell? I mean, given that these, given that these bodies had been in the ground for for months, how could they tell if it was a Union soldier or a Confederate soldier? You basically, part of what Pete said earlier, location, location played a role. Things like shoes, undergarments, sometimes coats. You couldn't go just by the uniform because so many soldiers picked up discarded pieces of you know, uniforms belonging to to the other army as as necessary, but this was not an exact science, and and some bodies were definitely misidentified in this process. This is a really really poor image. I'm sorry how bad it is. It's just impossible to blow this up and still have it look good. But this is an image of the burial crew at work. Here they are digging um digging up some graves uh, near Hanover Junction to move these soldiers to the National Cemetery. So. When they came up with the body that they deemed to be Union, they put it in a coffin. If there had been a headboard associated with it where it was you know, originally resting, they would take that headboard 
a long nail it to the coffin. Weaver had an iron hook that he would use to sort of examine the, the, the pockets for any kind of identifying information. And if he found anything, he would record it all um, in his logbook and then write a copy of it on the, the coffin itself. And sometimes they discovered personal articles, um, you know, Bibles, silverware, photographs, diaries, things in their pockets. And when they did, they were set aside to be returned to relatives or friends later on. Um, so these, at the time of the dedication of the National Cemetery in November of 1863, this was still very much of a work in progress. The, the, the exhuming and, mo and moving of bodies was far from complete, but the, cemetery, the, the ceremony nonetheless played out with the, the really the, the two of the most famous orators of the age, Abraham Lincoln and, and Edward Everett. Lincoln's speech in particular, you know, has, has become so well known for a variety of different reasons. You know, it's one, it's, it's been deemed one of the most influential speeches in world history, maybe the most famous speech ever given in the English language. And I think there are, are a lot of different reasons for that. But one of the things that is really remarkable about this speech is the way that Lincoln managed to marry a very specific message to a war-weary northern population with universal concepts, you know, producing something that was profoundly meaningful at that time for that audience and at the same time for future generations. Lincoln in the National Cemetery made Gettysburg a, an American icon. He, you know, elevated it to a position of nearly unparalleled symbolic significance as the, the, the physical manifestation of American ideals. You know, he made the union cause and the union deaths here synonymous with the, the deepest currents of national identity and, and the, the, the ideals of the American Republic. And he gave listeners a very powerful reason to press on with the war. He promised, you know, if you stay the course, not only will you be able to save this nation, but you'll also be able to preserve democracy, you know, not just for the United States, but for the world at large. And Lincoln's words were elastic enough that they could encompass multiple definitions of democracy and freedom in, in every generation sense. And because they have, I think, because those words have never lost their power or significance, thus the Battle of Gettysburg itself, the memory of the battle has never lost its power or its significance. The Gettysburg Address, the cemetery, you know, both of those have been used throughout the last 160 years for a variety of purposes, you know, sustaining the nation during the Great Depression, shoring up public morale during global wars, in, during the Cold War, encouraging an interventionist foreign policy, like legitimizing the civil rights movement, um, both legitimizing and discrediting anti-war protests during Vietnam, that this speech is perpetually elastic, which of course doesn't mean that as historians, we should not strive to understand it for what it was at the time, for what it is as a primary source. But the reason that it has meant so much to so many people is because of that melding of the, the contemporary meaning and those universal ideas. Um, just to talk a little bit before we end and, and, and go into more of a discussion of, about the, the commemorative landscape of the battlefield. It, it might be hard to imagine it looking at it today, but just as Confederates were originally barred from the National Cemetery, they were also excluded from the early commemorative efforts on the field. The leaders of the GBMA, saw Gettysburg very much as a Union Memorial Park. There was no space for Lee's defeated army in their vision for the landscape. And they immediately began to think about how do we draw visitors? How do we get veterans to come? How do we get tourists to come? How do we make the most of the expanding railroad network around the country and you know, tap into that to bring train, you know, train cars worth of veterans and families here to Gettysburg. How could we grow a tourist industry here, essentially? And their one of their initial answers, well, there were multiple initial answers. Some of them were, you know, entertainment, pool halls, um, amusement parks, beer halls, things like that. But on the other hand, 
one of their answers was, was public art, that if we create beautiful public art, people will come here to, to see it. So within 15 years of the battle, there were more than 300 union monuments on this field and, and regimental associations were often competing with each other to make theirs you know, the biggest or the, or the most eye-catching. This is just a photo from one monument dedication. This is the, the 15th Massachusetts. This was in 1886. And so as more and more tourists began to come on these railroad cars to Gettysburg and, and, and make this a place of pilgrimage, it became more and more important to surviving veterans to guarantee their place in public memory of the war by putting a monument here. Um, when we look at these monuments today, there's, there's really no trace of the various controversies and shouting matches that accompanied the installation of, of many of them. Veterans were not always of the same mind about how the battle should be memorialized and, and nor did they all share the same memories of what had happened here. Veterans of the 72nd Pennsylvania were so invested in their own memory of their role repulsing Pickett's charge and their conception of how their actions should be memorialized that when the regimental associations of the other units that had been around them and the officers of the GBMA said, hey, no, no, you, you weren't there on July 3rd. You weren't out there. You can't put a monument out there because you weren't out there. They started digging the foundations anyway without permission and they got arrested and they took their case to the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court and the court ultimately decided in their favor. And they then put up this monument um, in 1891. And when I look at that monument, all I see is like a permanent ha 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 to the other units around them. It was about, it was about inscribing their own memory at the expense of the memories of others around them and showcasing the, the, the supposed legitimacy of, of, of that narrative. Um, the cachet of having a monument at Gettysburg was significant enough that men of the 84th Pennsylvania pressed to put a monument here, despite the fact that they weren't actually here in July of 1863. They were supposed to be, but they were diverted at the last minute to Westminster, Maryland, where they had guard duty guarding Union supply lines. So they took part in the Gettysburg campaign, but not in the battle itself. There were a lot of other battlefields where this regiment could have placed a monument without any controversy, but they refused to back down. Gettysburg, in their minds, had become the nation's preeminent Union Memorial Park, where the sacrifice and devotion and triumph of the Union Army would be forever enshrined, and they wanted to be part of that. The men of the 84th and their officers argued that it wasn't their fault that their orders had changed at the last minute, that they had not only done important work, but they had helped to make the victory at Gettysburg possible. And finally, GBMA officials just sort of threw up their hands and said, fine, you know, you were part of the campaign, at least put up your monument, but we're going to set your flank markers differently than everybody else's. They didn't have, they, however, they did not mandate them to say anything specific on the monument itself about the fact that they hadn't been there. And if you go out and look at this monument today, the fact that the flank markers are pointing in a different direction is the only cue that you'll have that there is something funny about this monument. And, and I think that story is really important because it, it reminds us that for these men, like, this was not just marking the field of Gettysburg was never just about battle actions. You know, the, the point for the men of the 84th was not that, that was not, oh, we want to tell future generations we guarded supply trains. No, it was to commemorate their service in this war for the Union and honor their comrades, whether they died, you know, close to Gettysburg or far away. A flank marker, that's a good question. When you look at many, many markers on the field, you'll see like the marker itself and then buried in the grass on either side, there'll be like these very small stones that will show you this is where the end of the line was in this direction and this is where the end of the line was in the other direction. And in most, um, most monuments at Gettysburg, they are, they're pointing, I think, north and south at this monument, they're pointing east and west. 
you would never interpret that to mean something like, oh, these people weren't actually here. But that was the GBMA's compromise. Um, that, there's more I could say, there's a lot more Pete could, could say, but we're, you know, we're getting basically at, at four o'clock now. And I wanna make sure that we do have some time for, for a little bit of, of conversation. Um, the, the last thing that I want to that I would like to show you is the the first Confederate monument on Culp's Hill. This was put up in uh, what year was it? This was 1886, and this was super controversial, as you would imagine. First Confederate monument. There's a lot of debate about whether it was legitimate to put it here. There was a lot of pushback from Union veterans after it was placed here. One of the, the primary sources that um, we had circulated to you is a, a piece from a Pittsburgh newspaper from 1889 about the, 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 the utter horror um, of, of men involved in the Grand Army of the Republic Union Veterans Association post in Pittsburgh saying, this monument needs to come down. This is offensive. This is, these men committed, committed treason. Why should they have a monument at Gettysburg? And the language that they use in that, in, in the resolution that's covered in this article and in some other, other resolutions, this was a bit of an ongoing battle, is incredibly it's, 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 it's interesting because it is in many ways incredibly contemporary, uses a lot of the same words and a lot of the same arguments that you'll hear today in debates about the legitimacy of Confederate monuments. And I, I shared it with you because I think it's vitally important to understand that debates about monumentation and commemoration and what should be remembered and who has the authority to place something somewhere and whose vision of the past deserves legitimacy these are not things that people suddenly woke up to in the last five years. These are debates that have been happening forever since the Civil War itself, during the Civil War itself. The first monuments were put up during the war and some of them were taken down by the opposing side. Um, these, these battles have always been with us because they are fundamentally battles about memory, memory, and the significance of that memory in the present. Um, the regimental, the leader of the regimental association that put this up gave a speech just a few days before the dedication ceremony. It wasn't here, but it was about the, the, this monument that they were putting up where he explicitly talked about the, the, the present day purposes of this monument, which they hoped would encourage the Maryland state legislature to uh, allocate more money for pensions for Maryland Confederate veterans. He explicitly talked about what he hoped this monument would do in the in the present, and he he said this monument shows that we have power, and power always. Um, it's a great it's a great line. Power power com always compels respect. So. When we look at these commemorative structures, I think it's vitally important that we understand that the people who put them up were engaged in constant debate and critique, and we should be as well. So that's probably kind of the end for, for me, but if, if, if you don't mind hanging on a few more minutes, I'm sure that both Pete and I would be really happy to talk about anything in more detail or, you know, hear any observations or questions that you have. Dr. Titus, my question is about uh, the modern Confederate monuments at Gettysburg. For the most part, they're all confined to, to West Confederate Avenue. When was that mandate put in place that they had to go in there and couldn't go anywhere else? It's really following from the fact that all monuments were supposed to be on the original line of battle, that monuments were supposed to be where a union started, or, or where a unit, not unit, unit began, not where they ended up. So that's why Confederate monumentation is so heavily 
concentrated along Seminary Ridge. It was never stated explicitly Confederate monuments have to be in this part of the battle, but Confederate monuments have to be where, where the lines originated. And that, that has certainly caused controversy over time. Um, the Virginia Commission that put up the Virginia monument, they argued pretty strenuously to have it at the angle, and that was shot down. Um, the more recently, the, the Louisiana one, they wanted to be, they wanted to be kind of way out at the extent of their attack on July 2nd. And they went so far as to, to argue, you know, hey, we're taxpayers too. So why shouldn't we be able to put our monument where we want? And the, throughout the generations, the various custodians of the park have always come back with monuments have to be where the line originated. And that was the, that was the heart of the controversy with the 70, 72nd Pennsylvania as well. The, the regiments all around them were like, no, you were started back there. You never even got out there, but they were like, oh no, no, we started up there. And So if there's evidence to back up, like building a monument, could a monument be built like tomorrow or throughout this year, perhaps? Or is there kind of like a cutoff as to when? It's a really good question. Um, park policy is that the battlefield is essentially closed for new monumentation. And that comes, that, that comes out of the general management plan. It comes out of the cultural landscape report. It comes out of the, the park's premier concern for restoring the landscape of 1863. Um, they are, of course, not saying that the monuments that are already there should be taken away to restore that landscape, but they do not want to see the field perpetually open for new monumentation, which they feel would be increasingly confusing to visitors. The exception to that is monuments to a group or an individual whose contributions and importance have not received their due respect over time are allowed. So monuments in theory, you know, one could monuments to, to civilians, monuments to the various aspects of the civilian experience, monuments to the enslaved who were with Lee's army, mon monuments to the, the free black population of Gettysburg. In theory, those, th those projects could happen, but monument projects have never been funded by the federal government or the National Park Service. A group would have to come in with money and then get a design approved, get an inscription approved, get a location approved, you know, so on and so forth. Pete, you're muted. I should quickly add that if, if there is someone in Congress uh, who has enough power, uh, they can push and get a monument on the battlefield. And example of that is the Mississippi Monument. It's a small monument, um, uh, part of Pickett's, or excuse me, part of Pettigrew's uh, uh, assault. And it's not historically in the right place. And it, as Joe pointed out, uh, there are these very clear and strict regulations about restricting or actually prohibiting uh, any additional monuments, but <laughs> I, I forgot who was the Senate. It was Republican. It was Trent Senator. Lott. Kit Lott. Kit Lott had the power, and so he was able to get this Mississippi monument, not far from the Bryan farm, in fact. Uh, so there's some exceptions, but it's very rare, as, as uh, Joe points out. I, and I that's it, recent. Uh, like dude, that, that is just in the right, last right, 10, right. 10 to 15 years. During the 1960s, there was in 70s, there was this huge expansion of the commemorative landscape, particularly the Confederate commemorative landscape. And that was embraced by the park as a way to, in their perspective, um, you know, tell that side of the story and ensure that Confederates also had monuments, given the fact that the, the Union monuments numerically so far outnumbered the, you know, anything placed by Confederates on the field at that point. And I just say something else for you all to think about uh, in terms of what visitors understand or see as being historical. And of course, it's almost always associated with monuments, but often those very same visitors 
It went the battlefield to be restored or returned to its wartime appearance, which we also know that that's impossible, particularly when you want mighty mutation as well. And so what gives people a sense of it being historical and significant and important is a fascinating question to me. And one that as public historians always have to keep in mind as we try to find ways to engage people, but to get them to think more historically, to think more critically about the past. And that's of course, that's a, that's a tough challenge when you have a family that's, well, a family. And so they've got kids and they've got, you know, maybe an hour, maybe two to three hours. How do you tell them what happened? And then how do you get the layers of the past awakened into that reality? And then also help them appreciate how that memorial or commemorative landscape is shaping and influencing the way people see the history of 1863. Uh, again, that's a tall order, uh, all super important questions and the kinds of questions that public historians, uh, that's what they have to engage. And uh, you know, I think that the park is doing its best here at Gettysburg with the Confederate mining invitation uh, to put in waysides that will help visitors understand why those monuments were dedicated at a particular time, what was the intention or the message of those monuments, the people who uh, were behind it. And they're trying to do that. And I think that that's going to be, again, another important story, surprisingly, uh, one that hasn't been terribly accessible to the public until really the last year or two at, at most. Appreciate you all joining us, particularly on your, on your break. Uh, I'm on sabbatical now, so I'm the break is, is ongoing for me for a little bit. Uh, but I know you have, what, two weeks left before classes begin, roughly, I think. Uh, so, you know, like I said, we so appreciate you taking your time to do this. I hope some of you will give consideration to the Bohanka program. If you're at all intrigued by our summer internships, we do have some that are still available. Um, just very quickly, uh, they pay, we get free housing from the park, and the stipend is about 1500. Is that correct, Jill? Roughly around 1500. Um, one of the uh, issues is often transportation. You almost always need to have a car, but we have sites that need, that have openings. You can correct me, Jill, if I'm wrong. Manassas, Fredericksburg, and Appomattox. Yes, yes. and Vicksburg at the moment. Excuse me, and Vicksburg as well. So, you know, give that some thought. Have any questions about the program? Any questions about the public history minor or civil warrior studies, please reach out to us and I will be happy to have a conversation with you. Absolutely. And thank you very much for joining us today. This has been fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right, y'all, take good care of yourselves. Enjoy the rest of your break.